This video was made possible by CuriosityStream. Generally speaking, I think military enthusiasts can grasp the concept of a tank. Shocking, I know. I'd perhaps go a step further and say it's also not that hard to understand the concept of a tank platoon either. I mean, it's usually just three to five tanks divided in a finite amount of ways. But when you start getting into how tanks are supported in combat, it gets a little more complicated. In reality, tanks not only fight with other tanks, but with other types of units that make up for their deficiencies and enable them to do their jobs. This practice is accepted at least in principle by most major militaries that field tank forces, from the US, Russia, and China, to Sweden, Canada, and Japan, even if sometimes implementation can be a little lackluster. In this video, I'm going to go through the US Army specifically and examine how they reinforce their Abrams tank units to go to war. Mainly the US because they publish all their manuals online, and my core military audience is people who rank somewhere in this range. But if you're in a different military, we'd be happy to hear what you do in the comments. But first, I'm going to tell you about our sponsor, CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries made by the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. They're adding new shows every week, and by that I mean there's basically a whole new lineup on their front page since the last time I talked about them. You might be interested in KGB The Sword and the Shield, a history of Russia's intelligence agencies told from the perspective of its veterans and victims. Normally, CuriosityStream is only $20 a year, which is already a pretty good value, but they're cutting you guys a deal. If you click the link in the description and use promo code BATTLEORDER, or go to curiositystream.com slash battleorder, you'll get 25% off of unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. That's just $1.25 a month, 13 times cheaper than Netflix. So, go get yourself a deal on some documentaries, and you'll be helping us create content here. But back to the topic at hand. The focus here will be on the Armor Company team, which are based on pure armor companies. The basic armor company is composed of a company HQ and three tank platoons. Each tank platoon has four Abrams, either M1A2 SEP V2s or M1A1 SAs, split into an A section under the platoon leader and a B section under the platoon sergeant. These sections mutually support each other's movement and allow the platoon to be split evenly to support infantry engineers or what have you. The company HQ meanwhile has two tanks, one for the company commander and one for the executive officer. These tanks allow company leadership to move with their tank platoons across the same terrain and in the face of enemy fire, but they can also act as backup tanks if the platoons take casualties. The HQ's rear echelon has an M113A3 APC for the first sergeant, which can be used to set up a forward command post. An LMTV supply truck towing a water tanker is also organic to the company, as well as two to three Humvees for transporting company leadership in situations where tank is not appropriate. In addition to these organic elements, there are few attachments that are made to this company that are less situational and more all the time affairs. For example, each armor company has a field maintenance team attached from its battalion's forward support company to provide it repairs and vehicle recovery. This generally includes a Humvee for the motor sergeant and Abrams mechanics, an SECM Humvee or contact truck for minor repair work, a PLS truck with a mobile workshop, an M88A2 Hercules armored recovery vehicle for towing tanks, and another MTV cargo truck. Another habitual attachment is an armored ambulance with medics from the Battalion HQ, which provides ground-based medevac back to the Battalion aid station with en-route care. Note that in the future, the M113 is planned to be phased out by the AMPV, which is essentially a turretless Bradley. And lastly, a fire support team or FIST is attached from the brigade's Field Artillery Battalion to coordinate fire support and make recommendations to the commander on how fires are to be used. Such fires can include battalion level 120mm mortars, brigade level 155mm artillery, and if a JTAC is not present, emergency close air support. These are attachments that are made even in the rear and functionally act as part of the company, but when on a mission, even more augmentations can be made. To create tank infantry teams, the standard procedure is typically for an armored company to trade a platoon with one of the battalion's infantry companies. 
For an armor company team, this nets two tank platoons and one infantry platoon with four Bradleys and three nine-man squads. Rifle platoons can be further task organized internally by creating an ad hoc weapon squad out of the spare weapons pool, but that's a different video. Platoons can be further split up and reorganized to create shorter lived combined arms platoons within the company team, such as pairing two tanks with two Bradleys. If there's a credible air threat, which is now more common than ever even with low tier opponents due to the proliferation of small drones, a Stinger Manpads team on a Humvee can be attached. In the near future though, such teams will be organic to the companies rather than attached from outside. To provide mobility support when breaching obstacles, sappers from the Brigade Engineer Battalion could be attached to each company. This could mean as little as a single engineer squad mounted in a Bradley. Or if the company is a breaching force leading a battalion attack through significant obstacles, they could temporarily receive a composite engineer platoon to enable them to cross the gap. An example would be something like three engineer squads, an assault breacher vehicle, and bridging assets. If the unit has to go through a minefield, each armor company has roughly three mine clearing blades and one mine roller earmarked for it to mount the leading tanks. So in summary, a fully task organized armor company team with all the bells and whistles has enablers from basically every supporting subunit of their parent brigade and battalion. And they may be reinforced with more stuff, in some cases more so than others. The next step above the company team is the task force, based on a combined arms battalion. Since 2016, armored BCTs have had two armor heavy battalions with the headquarters and headquarters company, two armor companies, one mechanized infantry company, and a forward support company. The brigade also has an infantry heavy battalion, which has two infantry companies and one armor company. For deployments, combined arms battalions form task forces, which as the name suggests are task organized to fulfill a certain mission. For example, the 1st Battalion of the 67th Armor Regiment, which is a cab part of the 1st Armor Division's 3rd Brigade, is sometimes called Task Force Dealer or Task Force 167. In some cases, these task forces might not even have that much attached to them, and in others might even have stuff taken away. They do vary, but here are some hypotheticals based on real-world examples for two very different situations. First, a task force charged with a major breaching operation against a fortified defensive line might form two company teams to take on the main effort and maintain a pure company to support by fire. It might have one or two engineer companies attached to it to enable it to maneuver through minefields and obstacles and open a breach for the rest of the brigade. A platoon of Avengers mounting Stinger air defense missiles or the newer M Shorad system could be attached to suppress enemy UAVs or helicopters that penetrate the unit's larger air defense net. And a Paladin howitzer battery could be attached in direct support to provide heavy indirect fires. All the while, the task force is working directly under its parent brigade. Such a setup is very similar to what some first line armored task forces ran during Operation Desert Storm. Conversely, if a forward deployed task force is being redeployed to provide armor expertise to help a light infantry brigade advise and assist a foreign military, an armor heavy cab could leave its mechanized infantry company and pick up a civil affairs team, special forces element, and a foreign partner motorized infantry company. At the same time, its mechanized infantry company could be deployed to another area in support of another infantry brigade's counterinsurgency operations. During this time frame, elements of the battalion would be working under two different brigades, neither of which it's permanently assigned to. Something like that wouldn't have been out of place during the 2010s in Iraq and Afghanistan. But as I said before, task forces vary quite a bit and exactly what a battalion commander controls will depend on what's necessary. If you liked this video, check out this video on the evolution of mechanized infantry squads at the height of the Cold War. We'll see you over there.